Uh, thank you all uh, so much for being here and for the warm welcome. I've had the chance to spend the last couple of days here on campus uh, going on long runs down the Wabash River, eating a delicious burger uh, and, uh, and root beer float at Triple X. And I haven't yet been to the chocolate place, but I've heard good things. <laughs> So uh, I'm really honored to, to be here today and talk to you guys about sort of my experience um, being a political science major, um, being from you know, a liberal arts background and sort of working my way into tech uh, at Google and Facebook and into venture capital, uh, like she mentioned, and, uh, and really just tell you a few stories from the book that I wrote, um, which uh, if you guys haven't had a chance to read, I won't spoil all the stories. I'll just tell you two or three of them. So there's still plenty more uh, where that came from. Um, so I'm really excited to uh, introduce today this man here. Um, are any of you guys familiar with uh, C.P. Snow, Charles Percy Snow? One in the back, yeah. <laughs> uh, so Charles Percy Snow, uh, he was both a physicist and a novelist. And so he was somebody who kind of walked both of these lines of uh, you know, fuzzy and techy. Um, C.P. Snow delivered a really famous lecture in 1959, so going back almost 60 years. Um, he delivered uh, the Reed Lecture at Cambridge University. And this lecture became known as the Two Cultures Lecture because he sort of lamented this growing chasm between the sciences and the humanities. And he said, you know, hold on, we've got people that are studying the laws of thermodynamics that haven't ever read Shakespeare, and we've got people that are, you know, reading uh, English that you know, never learned the first thing about biology. And we've got to sort of break down these two, these two silos and really bring uh, the humanities and the sciences together. And so the two cultures, you know, we might think that we've moved past this notion. You know, fast forwarding 58 years, uh, you know, certainly we're doing a better job at kind of blending these two sides. But yet, sort of when you look around um, Silicon Valley, for example, you know, we, we have such a focus on learning to code, such a focus on sort of learning the computer science skills, that oftentimes we forget the context and how we apply that technology, how we apply the code. You know, we take a look at the rise of artificial intelligence or AI. You know, we hear about this in the news all the time now. And we're only starting to kind of scratch the surface on thinking about some of the ethical implications and some of the other aspects, the philosophical aspects um, behind AI. You know, we talk a lot about STEM, we talk a lot about science, technology, engineering, and math, but we sort of put that at odds with the liberal arts and sort of this one versus the other. But the, in actuality, you know, when you take a step back and you look at the letters of STEM, you know, sciences and mathematics are actually fundamental components of the liberal arts. If you go back, you know, to sort of the core beliefs of the liberal arts, it's about tugging on the mind in different ways, learning uh, things from all sort of backgrounds, being able to see from another's perspective, learn that empathy, um, and so really, you know, this is a false opposition that we sort of put STEM on a pedestal and we put liberal arts somewhere else. And, you know, we need to sort of remember back to C.P. Snow in 1959 that it's not about one versus the other. It's really about how we blend these two things together and sort of break down the two cultures debate. So uh, this is where uh, I'm from, which is out west. We have a few more palm trees, but we have a few fewer astronauts. You guys have all the astronauts here. <laughs> I've learned you have 19, is that right? 24. 24. Wow, okay, 23. Um, that's amazing. So, and uh, at Stanford and you know, on campus and around Silicon Valley, what sort of bubbled a little bit beyond the acreage of, of campus there is this terminology of fuzzies and techies. And that's where the lingo of the book comes from. It's not uh, terms that I made up, but fuzzies and techies are actually, uh, they go back to the 1960s, 1970s on Stanford campus where people sort of have this lighthearted moniker or this association where they say, hey, you know, are you taking more fuzzy classes this quarter? Are you taking more techie classes this quarter? Um, and really, you know, the fuzzies were people like me that studied political science, political theory, um, we studied uh, social sciences or psychology. Um, you know, the techies were the people that studied computer science, like lots of people in this building probably, um, you know, or mechanical engineering, engineering sciences. Um, but really, again, it was about this false, this kind of false opposition because if you go to a mechanical engineering class, a lot of it is about design thinking. A lot of it is about user experience research or asking the right questions. Um, you know, if you go to a political science class, oftentimes you're thinking about uh, nuclear deterrence and you're doing sort of game theory uh, endeavors. And so there's a quantitative element to, you know, fuzzy, tech, fuzzy uh, subjects. And there's a very soft um, sort of uh, communicative element to some of the technical uh, subjects. And so, you know, again, 
going back to CP Snow, not sort of one versus the other, but how we bring these two together. And so, you know, when I looked around Silicon Valley, this was something that sort of struck me was that there's this, uh, this predominant narrative about, uh, you know, science, technology, engineering, and math being sort of, you know, Silicon Valley is this monolith of techies. And taking a step back, I said, wait a minute. You know, whether it's Susan Wojcicki at YouTube, you know, who studied history and literature, um, obviously Sheryl Sandberg at Facebook studied economics, um, but the founders of so many of these companies as well, you know, came from all these different backgrounds. So Ben Silberman, who founded Pinterest, I was a political science guy. Um, Reid Hoffman, who we all think of uh, around LinkedIn. Uh, Reid Hoffman has a grad degree in philosophy. His undergrad degree was in something called symbolic systems, which was really a blending of linguistics, logic, math, psychology, and a little bit of computer science. Um, but what's amazing is you kind of look down this list and you realize that this notion of tech being a monolith of just techies is not really true. You know? So most recently, you know, look at Reddit uh, founder uh, Alexis Ohanian, a history major. Uh, you know, so, so many good examples here. And so really kind of taking a step back, I said, let me tell this other narrative about Silicon Valley that's not just about the techies, but it's about how we humanize technology, you know, how we bring context and code back together, how we sort of bring uh, ethics and AI back together. And so that's kind of the, the subject of the book and what I'll talk about a little bit today. Um, and so I want to tell you three stories from the book, and I kind of want to myth bust some of these terms that we might hear on a daily basis, you know, as we scroll through Facebook news feed or we think about, um, you know, we, we look at headlines. You know, one of those terms that we see quite often is this term big data. How many of you guys have heard big data or seen it? Probably today, right? <laughs> uh, so a few years ago in, in venture capital where we, you know, meet with lots of different startups, Almost every startup that we met with, you know, you get to slide two or slide three, and there it would be in the cross, you know, big letters on the screen, it would say, this is a big data startup. Now those words have changed to AI, or they've changed to machine learning, or they've changed to something else. But there's always sort of a term that's, you know, part of the conversation. So, you know, we have this notion that uh, with more and more sensors, with more and more information, uh, suddenly we'll just have this magical answer that will appear to us through this thing called big data. Um, but, you know, taking a step back, I want to tell you a story about somebody who founded a company called Kaggle. And Kaggle was founded by a guy named Anthony Goldblum. And Anthony was not really a techie. Uh, Anthony was an economist. And he was working for the Australian Treasury. So he was based in Canberra, Australia. And he was invited to do an externship. And he went to London. And he was working with The Economist magazine in London. And one of the stories he was writing was on big data, because it was something that was sort of in the news. And Anthony started realizing that all these companies and all these governments had all this you know, information that was sitting kind of siloed, locked away. And he said, you know, what if we could unlock all this big data and we could allow people from all different walks of life, all different backgrounds, all different methodologies, ways of questioning, uh, to ask questions of the data and come at it from different angles. And, you know, what would the answers that they would come up with be? And he said, you know, what if, could we turn big data or data science um, into a sport? where we could have you know, competitions, we could put prizes up, and people could you know, ask all different questions of, of these, of these uh, data sets. And so one of the earliest uh, competitions that was posted on Kaggle, and Kaggle has since actually sold to Google. It's now part of Google Cloud. It's not independent anymore. Um, but you can still go on to Kaggle, and you can still sort of see uh, some of the case studies and some, some of the stories like this. Um, but NASA and the Royal Astronomical Society and the European Space Agency they had been working for 10 years to try to quantify or come up with an answer for how much dark matter was out in the universe. And this is something that's way beyond, way over my head. You know, dark matter, uh, this is an issue for cosmologists, this is an issue for physicists. Um, and that's kind of what NASA thought. They said, we're going to post this data set, but we don't really have any uh, idea who's going to be able to answer this better than we have, because we've been working for 10 years on trying to quantify dark matter. And actually, within two weeks, there was a glaciology PhD student, this guy named Martin, Martin O'Leary, who was in the UK. And he was approaching the data, approaching this question from such a different angle that he actually came up with a better approximation for this coefficient, a better approximation for how much dark matter was in the universe, because he was using uh, different examples, different uh, ways of thinking, coming at it from when you evaluate an image uh, from space on where the edges of a glacier are. You can't quite see where the edges are, so you have to you know, do all these complicated calculations and figure out 
um, you know, w where they might be. And he used that same technique to uh, you know, apply it to this problem. And so I think it really uh, speaks to an example that um, you know, we talk so much about data science, but we don't include this other part of the equation, which I call data literacy where it's really about you know, asking the right questions, not just about sort of the answers and hearing in the data. Um, you know, and going back about 300 years, uh, Voltaire has this great quote, which I kind of paraphrase, paraphrase here, which is, you know, judge a person by their questions, not by their answers. And you know, I think increasingly we live in this world where everything is Googleable. People say, well, you know, why would I learn that? I could just Google it. Well, how many times have you sat in front of your cursor you know, blinking in your face with Google, you've got the world's information, all of it, sitting right there. And you don't know what question to ask. And I think it goes back to this point, you know, what we're learning in liberal arts, what we're learning in, you know, institutions like Purdue, is the ability to ask the right questions, right, to think about these things. Um, and these are, you know, really valuable skills that are not going away anytime soon. So this is a notion, you know, that, um, you know, data equals knowledge equals wisdom. And you know, it's sort of a debate um, that's been going on for many, many centuries. Uh, so going back to, you know, to Plato, going back to Sir Francis Bacon, there was sort of this notion that with more and more information, we would have knowledge, and with knowledge, we would have wisdom. And uh, actually, in 2009, the then editor of Wired magazine, Chris Anderson, wrote a great piece where he said, you know, it's the end of the scientific method. We have so much data now that we don't really need to ask these questions anymore. Answers will just sort of bubble to the surface, and we don't need to have these sort of uh, large inquisitions uh, you know, through, through the, sci the scientific inquiry and scientific method. And I think that that's been proven to be largely false. You know, we still need people to be asking the right questions of the data. Um, and so you know, as we think about all these forthcoming trends, we talk about you know, deep learning AI, right? Well, that's, that's so profound, but we forget that we still need deep thinking humans, right? And that's where all of us come into play. And that's where you know, my own background, uh, being from political science and political theory to sort of my extended family in places like Idaho and in Colorado, they always said, well, you know, what are you doing at Google? You know, you're not an engineer, you're not writing code on a day-to-day -day basis. What is it that you do there? And you, know, you forget that 40, 50% of all these companies are people that are deep thinking humans uh, asking the right questions and helping steer the ship. So the second story I want to tell you guys, um, and this one gets to another sort of buzzword that we hear about all the time, is algorithms, right? So this is another one that we're probably seeing in our newsfeed on a day-to-day -day basis. Actually, newsfeed is powered by one of these, right? Um, and so there's a great story uh, that I want to tell about this company called Stitch Fix. And are any of you guys familiar? Any of you guys customers of Stitch Fix? A few? I haven't tried it myself. I know they just debuted Stitch Fix Men's recently. Um, but Stitch Fix is, in effect, it's uh, Netflix for personal fashion. And so uh, actually, like Anthony Goldblum, founder of Kaggle, uh, the founder of Stitch Fix was actually also a poli-sci econ major. And uh, she had a background in, in retail. She had a background in social commerce. She'd done a couple internships in social commerce. She really loved fashion. And she had this problem where she was working in retail consulting. She didn't have any time to shop. And she sort of outsourced it to her sister. She'd outsourced it to a friend. And she said, gosh, you know, I sit down after work, and I've got Netflix, and I've got my Netflix queue, and it always knows what movie to show me. Why can't I just have that for my closet? Why can't I just have fashion sort of thrown my way that, uh, you know, accords with my style, accords with my preferences? And so she said, you know, what if I could build Netflix for fashion? And so she asked this question. She identified a problem. She didn't have the background technologically to build it, but she really was passionate about this, and she knew how to communicate the idea well. And so she partnered with uh, two people. She said, well, you know, Stitch Fix is going to have a heavy logistics component. It's going to be about sending inventory, mailing inventory. That's pretty complicated logistically. And it's going to have this uh, machine learning component where we have to identify people's preferences. We have to get better over time. We have to serve them the fashion that they want to, that they want to see. And so she said, well, you know, who's really good at logistics? Walmart. And so she went to Walmart, and she found the then COO of Walmart.com. And she asked him if he would quit his job and start working for her. And he said, yeah, I'll do it. <laughs>
And so, you know, getting back to this sort of raw ability to communicate an idea with passion, with grit, um, sort of be able to look like you're about to run through a brick wall and no one's going to stop you, uh, she could do all those things. And so she was able to get this guy, you know, to quit his job uh, at Walmart.com and join her when she was still in her dorm room. And then she went after uh, Netflix. And she said, well, you know, if I have to get somebody who really knows machine learning, I'm going to go to the actual source. I'm going to go to the person at Netflix who built the algorithm and ran the data science team. And that guy's name is Eric Colson. And she also convinced Eric to quit his job. So this goes to show you, here's somebody with a lot of determination who really you know, understood this idea. She'd put together a presentation. She'd figured out you know, all the questions to ask. And she was able to then partner with these you know, A-list players uh, you know, at Walmart and at, 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 ne at Netflix uh, to build Stitch Fix. And so uh, you know, Eric really is kind of the man behind the, the Stitch Fix algorithm, the way that they serve all the fashion and clothing to people. And they deliver a box to your door. And the box contains five items of clothing. And those items are kind of based on what you've bought before, your Pinterest board, your style preferences. You ask, answer a bunch of questions on a survey. Um, and they, they have a lot of people that are kind of identifying all the different elements of clothing. You know, if it has a uh, button-down collar, it has this or that. Um, and through that, they, they sort of create a taxonomy. And they uh, then look at all this data that you've given them from your Pinterest board and all your answers to questions. And then they start serving you clothing. And what's really interesting about Eric is he's kind of a techie's techie. He's a very technical guy. But he also believes in the sort of uh, importance of certain human characteristics. So he's not trying to build a machine that takes over all the jobs of all the humans. What he says is, you know, actually, humans are really good at certain things. We're really good at face-to-face -face interaction. We're really good at reading people. We're really good at um, you know, having sort of a, an empathetic moment where we can connect one-on-one -on -one with, with somebody that may be a client. But we're not good at you know, running numbers and, and doing sensitivities and analyses and, you know, and, and assigning probabilities and all these things that machine learning is really good at doing. And so Eric actually talks about the Stitch Fix algorithm in two parts. He says he has an H algorithm and an M algorithm. And what that really means is sort of his human and his machine algorithm. So the machine algorithm is doing all of the, the rote calculation. And the human algorithm is actually trying to observe the biases the certain propensities that people have. You know, if I serve something to somebody in one part of the country versus another, I may have certain assumptions of, well, you know, this person is based in Brooklyn, New York. When they say they're fashion forward, they're, maybe they're overly fashionable, so I'm going to kind of skew one way versus another way. So I'm making my own calculations and my own biases. And so what Eric actually does is he uses machine learning um, to try to mitigate some of those biases. And you know, this is not to say that uh, algorithms are always you know, used for good. These same things can, can sort of go the other way. You know, there are examples uh, I talk about in the book, and I think many sort of problematic cases where we think about you know, having a lot of data in uh, policing, sort of crime maps, things like that. And you say, well, what if we could use algorithms to do predictive policing, where we could just observe all of the places where crimes had happened, and we could deploy police officers more effectively to those places. But then we take a step back and you say, well, if we're actually asking the right questions, that's reported crime data. Is reported crime data actually uh, you know, indicative of all crime? No. You know, certain biases or certain propensities of people to report crimes or not report crimes. So you know, again, it goes back to asking the right questions. Um, but in this case, I think it's a great example of how Eric is using machine learning to kind of supplement the human, not just replace the human. And so if you look at the numbers at Stitch Fix, you know, there's all this sort of hype around artificial intelligence and robotics. And you know, all these things are going to eat jobs and take jobs away. But really, you know, 70 data scientists, these are people with you know, PhDs and really versed in statistics and, and math. But there are 3,500 other people that do all the human-to-human -human stuff. They're the human-to-human -human interface on top of these you know, algorithm processes. And so you know, when we hear a lot about artificial intelligence, I would just ask you to sometimes think about flipping those letters around, not to be afraid of those words, but actually IA for intelligence augmentation rather than AI for artificial intelligence. And I think that this, in many ways, is sort of the direction of you know, a lot of these technologies will be supplementing all the things that we already do well as humans. Right? So if we focus on the things that are core kind of human characteristics, the things like human-to-human -human contact, being empathetic, 
um, learning to communicate, learning to collaborate. These are actually the very things that don't go away, that don't go to machines. So the third story I want to tell you guys is about the attention economy. So the attention economy is something that we also hear a lot about. Have you guys heard about this recently in the news? There was a great uh, TED talk recently by a guy named Tristan Harris. Uh, I talk about him in chapter five of the book. Um, Tristan was a former classmate who actually uh, sold his company to Google at the ripe old age, I think, of 27. And he became a uh, product manager at Google. He started uh, going to all these product meetings. He looked around. And he said, there's only you know, 200 of us that are product managers at all of Google, 40,000, 50,000 employees. And we all kind of looked the same. We all kind of did the same things before. We're all kind of optimizing for the same outcomes. And he started asking these questions about the attention economy. And so you know, going back to Steve Jobs, Steve Jobs, is, one of his early quotes was about how the personal computer should really be a bicycle for the mind, how it should really sort of unlock new abilities for all of us. And Tristan said, you know, in the US, what are the two things that people spend a lot of money on? Baseball and movie tickets. And you think those are big, big spending categories. But one of the things that people spend even more money on, which is kind of disconcerting, are slot machines, which is pretty crazy. Um, the reason, though, in, in many cases, is if you go back to you know, B.F. Skinner and sort of behavioral psychology, there's variable reward where something happens, something happens, then it hits. You sort of have this variation when you get rewarded. And those are things that are highly addictive. And so Tristan sort of looks at technology and he says, you know, wait a minute, when I scroll on my Instagram, I scroll through Facebook, I scroll through, I look for a notification in Snapchat, did somebody snap me, did they not? These are all variable reward structures that are drawing us in, drawing us in. And they're you know, run by you know, teams of engineers optimizing for our attention. And so he, you know, he just asks these kind of fundamental questions of, you know, what are we optimizing for? And I think it's a, an important thing that we sort of take, take a step back and consider you know, the value of all sorts of backgrounds, all sorts of people asking questions within these companies that are kind of coming at, it, at these problems from ethical angles from not just technological angles, right? So Tracy Chow, she's somebody that I wanted to talk to you guys a little bit about because Tracy is sort of on the flip side of liberal arts. Tracy was uh, only as an undergrad, she was an electrical engineer and she studied computer science and she said, you know, I was sort of a ballistic student, meaning I knew I was on this certain path and if I followed a certain trajectory, I could land my dream job, I could get to Facebook product manager, Google product manager, whatever that goal was. And for Tracy, it was to become a product manager first at Pinterest and then at a company called Quora. And Quora is a question and answer website you guys may be familiar with. And through that process, you know, she really put her head down and said, if I learn all the technical skills, I'm going to be completely set up for success at all these companies. And when she got to Quora, she was employee number four, you know, real startup. There wasn't a lot of direction, didn't know exactly what they were going to go left, they were going to go right. Uh, and she found that all the questions that she was uh, asking with her team, you know, when they were going to bars late night after, you know, all day in the office, she said all the debates that they were having were basically First Amendment debates. They were phil philosophical debates. They were trying to figure out if users were going to be inherently good and obey the rules on the platform, or if they were going to maybe deviate, be bad. Um, you know, what percentage would that be? Uh, how would they think about the different product ramifications if people were posting you know, inappropriate content? They would have to have moderation cues. They would maybe have to have people taking down spam. Um, and Tracy realized that um, you know, as a minority at the company, that she was one of the only people that cared about things like a block button. And so block button being um, you know, the way to take down reactive content or to reactively take down content and to be able to sort of uh, mitigate when people start violating things that are offensive to certain people. And so she realized that because she was, quote unquote, an edge case in the engineering speak, she was the only one that really cared about creating some of these technological uh, tweaks to the product that really changed the direction of the company. And so I think um, it's a great example of Tracy. She's come out in the last six months or so, and she's written a couple great pieces. One was in Medium and one was in Quartz uh, online, where she said, <clears throat> Excuse me, she said, I really wish that I had had a broader liberal arts education. I really wish I had studied philosophy. I really wish I had studied 
some of these First Amendment issues. Because the biggest questions, the ones that she didn't actually know how to answer, were those that were kind of from this uh, you know, softer side, from you know, not just her technical training. And she realized that you know, at a lot of these companies, there's still sort of this lack um, of, of, of expertise around some of these issues. And so she and Tristan are both uh, great examples of you know, people that are advocating not just for engineers in these companies, but really sort of balancing it out. And I think if you look at um, Stuart Butterfield, back to that slide of you know, interesting innovators and CEOs and founders that have come from different backgrounds other than just pure technology, uh, Stuart Butterfield has two degrees in philosophy. And he actually likens the process of building Slack to the process of philosophical inquiry. The process of becoming a product manager is you're trying to find product market fit. You're trying to get closer and closer to this approximation of something that may or may not exist. And it's a lot like a philosophy debate. And so Stuart actually says that his life as a product manager resembles a lot his life as a philosopher. And I think that you know, we have these sort of A to A relationships where you study engineering and you become an engineer. But we haven't yet communicated effectively the truth that philosophy is a great background for product. Um, you know, anthropology, sociology, those are great backgrounds for user experience research. There are all these sort of A to B relationships where we have the methodologies, we have the skill sets. And these are actually really desired components in all these companies. We just have to have the confidence to kind of step out there and, and do it. And so, you know, what sort of, taking a step back, you know, why, why does all this matter? Why do the liberal arts still matter? You know, we're, again, in this world of uh, the drumbeat of STEM has been steady and strong. And it's important, you know, we've talked about some of these big, you know, key terms of the day. You know, we look around uh, Facebook newsfeed and we, you know, you're hard pressed not to see articles about machine learning, big data, AI, robotics. Um, and I want to give you guys just a quick framework of something that I came across in the process of writing the book and how to, how to think about these things and why some of the skills that we're learning are still very, very valid. So there's a framework um, by two economists, David Otter and Darren Asamoglu, and they have this framework where they talk about manual and cognitive tasks. And I think this is a really helpful framework when you think about sort of what's the difference between AI and machine learning and robotics and all these you know, fancy words. And I'm sure many people in the room that come from the computer science department probably already know some of these things, so I'm preaching to the choir, I apologize. Um, but what's interesting about thinking in this framework is um, you know, manual tasks, uh, robotics apply to those, and cognitive tasks, machine learning or you know, artificial intelligence can apply to those. But really it comes down to which elements or which tasks within jobs are routine or are non-routine. Because I think if we take a step back and we look at any job, there are some things that we do over and over and over. You know, some, th some processes where we, we launch our email, we look for certain things, we make calendar invites, we, you know, we share things at certain times. Those are all relatively routine tasks. Those are all things that we could have machine learning or, or AI augment us and help us do that in a more effective way. But then there are these non-routine things where we, you know, we're asking the right questions, we're sort of doing something for the first time. We're kind of on the forefront, the, the avant-garde of you know, where, we're, where we're thinking. And those are the non-routine tasks. Those are the things that can't really be automated, whether by machines uh, or by robots. Right? And so you know, if we think about um, simple tasks, sort of the things in our daily life that we have best practices for, things that we can write down and we say, well, I've done this 10 times or 100 times, you know, those are things over time that machine learning can be good at. If it's a cognitive task, robots can be good at it if it's a manual task. But beyond that, you know, uh, if it's not, you know, if it's repetitive and it's sort of something that we can sort of do over and over and we can script it, we can program it. But if it's sort of beyond that, it's uh, actually, let me take a step back. So 30% 30 um, 30 of tasks within 60% of jobs, this is a study that. Um, the McKinsey Global Institute came out with in January of this year that sort of rebutted against uh, the 2014 study by Oxford where they said that roughly 50% of all jobs were at high risk of machine automation. You know, and this was something where Martin Ford's Rise of the Robots and sort of the pendulum swung all the way toward fear. And uh, you know, in 2017, McKinsey Global Institute said, wait a minute, you know, let's take a step back. Let's look at 800 different jobs and let's look at all the constituent tasks within those jobs. 
And let's look at what are the tasks that are highly repetitive, highly scripted, that are rote, that those are the ones that can go to machines. And all the things that are sort of beyond that, that are a little bit you know, less routine, uh, that can't be scripted, those are the things that are going to re remain the purview of humans. And so you know, when we look at what are those tasks that remain, those, again, are sort of the things that are in complexity, that are non-routine. They're things that you know, we can train for through programs like liberal arts. And so really, you know, one of the things that I want to kind of conclude with is how do we think about our education? You know, how do we think about how do we gain these skills, these flexible skills, to remain you know, relevant in this world that you know, is changing on a day-to-day -day basis? And one of the metaphors that I really, really like um, from a guy named Lewis Newman, and Lewis was a religious studies professor at Carleton College, and now he's a vice provost uh, at Stanford. And he talks a lot about how education should no longer be a plane ticket. It's no longer you know, getting from point A to point B to some destination where we kind of debate, uh, you know, is getting to Paris, France, or Beijing, China, which one's better? And that's kind of the debate we're having today. It's like, oh, did you study this? Did you study that? Well, that's, that's passe. That's irrelevant. This one's relevant. Um, and rather than having this sort of uh, debate, he really likens education to a passport. He says, you know, it's all about collecting stamps. It's all about sort of filling out the passport in various ways. So if you've traveled a lot to Europe, you probably should go experience Asia or Africa. Right? If you've been a lot in Asia, you should go to a different continent. And I think that this, in the same way, you know, if we're spending a lot of time in one department, uh, try to break the ice on something that scares you. So you know, if you are um, into coding, if you love uh, computer science, take a class that's in theater or something that gets you out of your comfort zone that really scares you. Because that'll improve your public speaking ability. That'll improve some of your, your soft skills, you know, your ability to think on your feet and be creative, uh, and vice versa. You know, if you're really intimidated by data science and statistics, make sure that you get one of those classes or two of those classes before you graduate. And I think that um, this sort of thinking, so back to Tracy's point where she said, you know, if I only get the right skills and I get on this ballistic path, then I, I'm going to end at my destination. And she said, you know, my destination is product manager at company XYZ. That's the best place I could possibly be when I graduate at 21, 22. Um, and she really regrets not having sort of the full passport. And so now is scrambling to say, you know, what are the books I can read? What are the ways I can debate philosophy? Can I join a book club at night? Can I take an improv comedy class to learn some of those speaking skills that I, I lacked before? And so I, I really like this metaphor, and I kind of want to leave you with, with that. Um, and, and finally, you know, uh, another sort of point that a guy named David Deming makes, um, and this is sort of in the conclusion of my book, um, David is a, he's an economist at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, and he says he's really an advocate of soft skills and social skills. And he's actually looked at a lot of data. He's got some great papers um, with NBER, which is a big economics uh, research kind of think tank. And his numbers actually show that just jobs in pure tech and pure STEM are actually kind of waning. And the jobs that are really on the rise are the ones that he calls high math, high social. So about sort of being conversant in some of the new technologies, being conversant, not intimidated by data, not intimidated by tech, um, but also having a lot of these soft skills that we've talked about. So the ability to collaborate, the ability to kind of be the human to human interface, um, have empathy. And these are all the things that you know, we learned through a plurality of different courses where we kind of tug on the mind in different ways. And so you know, in conclusion, I think the jobs of tomorrow, the ones that we'll graduate into, um, will have a technical component, for sure, but they also really, really rely on these things, you know, asking the right questions, having different methodologies and different ways of approaching problems, you know, helping to train the machine. So if you're kind of in the, the CS or EE department, you, know, you may be part of the sort of machine-to-human interface. You may be part of uh, helping train machines and helping them you know, mitigate bias of, of humans. But you know, they're an equal, if we look at the Stitch Fix example, probably a lot more jobs in the space of being the human-to-human -human interface as well. So you know, a lot of the focus in technology today, there's a lot of science fiction talk. There's a lot of focus on all these buzzwords that we sort of demystified a little bit today. And I would just ask you guys, and I think some of the skills that you're graduating with that are really, really important to add into this conversation are those about not just how we build, not just what we build, 
but also, you know, why are we building this in the first place? What are the big fundamental problems that we're going after solving? You know, I had a great meeting this morning at the Foundry here in Purdue, and you know, we're thinking about all the different IP, all the different technology that can be commercialized here at Purdue. But then you take a step back and you say, well, it's not just about taking technology and commercializing it. What are the big problems? Let's start with the problems first. And that's something that we all know intimately well. You know, every day we encounter problems. And if you encounter a problem and you have enough sort of grit and passion to put a framework around it and think about it rigorously and start telling that story with conviction, you can absolutely be the founder just like Ben Silberman was at Pinterest or uh, Katrina Lake was at Stitch Fix. You know, these were just people that identified clear problems that had a lot of passion and a lot of hustle to kind of build teams around them. They didn't necessarily have the coding skills. They didn't have the data science skills. But when you're able to kind of tell the story and convey it with conviction, then you can definitely be kind of the center of that equation. So, you know, this is something that Tim Cook said at the MIT commencement a few months ago. He said, I'm not worried about artificial intelligence giving computers the ability to think like humans. I'm more concerned with people thinking like computers without values or compassion. And I think that sums it up pretty well. So, how do you guys want to apply your ideas? That's, that's the question of the day. So again, you know, no answers, but I think like a good liberal arts uh, program in education, it's about asking these questions, right? Sort of tugging on the mind in different ways and thinking about, you know, as we go forward, as we graduate with these degrees, you know, how do we want to apply them? What are the problems that we see in the world? Um, and to use technology as a tool to help solve, you know, real problems. So thanks. <laughs>